The Ensemble podcast is intended for professional financial advisors. All discussion is limited to publicly available information and should not be interpreted as legal, professional or financial advice. Ensemble does not hold an AFS license nor provide any financial services. Before making investment decisions, you should obtain financial advice from a qualified financial advisor. G'day, Clayton here from Ensemble. Thanks for joining me for this podcast. It's a pleasure to be able to do this from time to time. Hopefully you enjoy. If you're not already on Ensemble, please go to Ensemble.com or find us in the App Store. You can't buy time, but you can save it. The advisor portal at MLC Life Insurance is just one way we're helping advisors streamline the advice process. Using the advice portal, advisors can generate quick quotes and indicative underwriting decisions in one place. This means less time spent on paperwork and more time focused on clients. To learn more about the MLC Life Insurance Advisor Portal and how it will save you time, visit our website or contact your distribution representative. G'day, how's it going? What do you know, Strike Light? It's been a while since I've uh, been uh, behind the microphone, but there's been a lot happening inside of Ensemble uh, as of late. Um, and we can discuss some of it that's coming up and some of it we can, you know, keep, keep, you know, shielded and under our wings for the time being. But one of the big things that certainly is public knowledge is that uh, Chairman Mao, otherwise known as Roxy, uh, fired himself uh, because we had the opportunity to work with our guest today, Craig Kiry. Mate, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Clayton. It's great to be here and uh, really, uh, really enjoying the time so far at an, at an ensemble and looking forward to uh, the ride ahead. Yeah. So, we got introduced uh, through a mutual friend, um, the the esteemed Robert Coulter. We did. And uh, and it became pretty obvious pretty quickly that uh, our, our, we have very similar views on the opportunities that are ahead of financial planning. Um, we certainly had an alignment in terms of values, uh, what we found it was important to grow a business, the impact that a business can have on the world. Um, and kind of pretty, and then, and then you were studying a PhD in financial planning and really, really quickly it, um, it was just, I'd been waiting to meet someone with your level of experience, um, who approached business in the same way. And very quickly it became obvious that we should do some work together. Um, absolutely. Like it was, you know, we, we got introduced uh, by Robert and we, we had a, a, a number of conversations. Um, I've been following the business um, for a number of years and seen it go through uh, the, the the growth that it's gone through and um, amazing profile uh, in the industry. But equally, uh, I um, when, when you obviously spoke to Roxy about me, he remembered a conversation that we had, um, you know, probably eight years ago at a, at a dinner, uh, which is always a good thing to remember that people do remember what you say at dinners, yeah. uh, where we where we actually had a really um, good conversation with, uh, with with Roxy and and his wife um, about culture and the importance of culture uh, in the business. Mm. And uh, you know, I think it was just a, a series of events that um, and a series of common beliefs around culture and values um, and just a passion for this industry that have. Uh, Led us to uh, join forces. Yeah, and and I mean, our entire team, you know, were, were extraordinarily pumped um, when they all got to meet you, and and also the exact alignment which which um, which I saw immediately. Um, and look, things have kind of taken off at the at the exact same stage that you've joined. So, I mean, we just launched in South Africa last week. Um, we're, we're, we've just kicked off a, a Series A raise, which you know, in a very short amount of time, is looking like it's half filled, uh, which which is super exciting. Um, we have some very interesting uh, meetings coming up in Singapore uh, in October, uh, which I mean, if these uh, go ahead. Um, could see Ensemble really sort of uh, go from an Australian and now South African-based application to, to a global platform um, that connects the whole industry. And um, that's a super exciting time for, for our company. And it's it, I, I just love that it coincides with uh, um, you joining. So, 
Uh, no, thank you. And it's look, it's great to be here. And I think one of the things that we sometimes don't realise in Australia is that Australia does lead the world in a lot of things with respect to financial services um, and a lot of things with respect to wealth management um, and financial advice. Our superannuation system or pension system is one of the leading systems in the world. And when I spent a lot of time in Asia, one of the things that was very easy to go and have conversations with um, a number of people across Asia and talk about Australia because they always looked um, to Australia as being that um, leader in so many different respects. And uh, that's when I when I joined, I was A, really pleased to see the growth that the business has achieved here in Australia. But equally, I actually wasn't surprised when you said, look, we're actually going to go live in South Africa because of course we would mm. because we've actually developed a leading platform here in um, Australia. Um, and that leading pl- platform absolutely has application um, on a global scale. The problems are the same. Yeah. The problems are the same. We're all dealing with the same problems globally. And uh, I think what, what what you and the and, and the team have done in positioning this business here in Australia really does um, really does set it up very very well um, for for global success. Absolutely. And and one of the re- you know one of the when I when I refer to your experience, uh, you know you, you you've had senior positions across sort of capital markets across technology companies um and and i kind of wanted to ask you know where did where did it start where where did it come from um you know you've you've kind of and the only reason i know your cv so well now is because i've been sending it to a few different locations um so i'm pretty familiar with 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 your body of work at this stage but i mean where did it start where did your passion for financial i mean there's, there's so few people who do a phd in financial planning i where where did the idea of the impact of financial planning, where did that come from and, and why did it resonate with you? That's a good question. It's, I haven't really thought about it that way. Um, probably go back to how my career started. I, I started uh, in a, in a stockbroking company in 1987. I actually started um, a week before the 1987 crash. <laughs> Um, and my, my children get really, uh, they, they look at me and go, Dad, you're so old when I talk about the 1987 crash as if I'm talking about the Great Depression, <laughs> but uh, even the GFC. But, 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 but I started in a, in a stockbroking company, um, as I said, a week before the 1987 wow. crash. But what I did is I started in a in a in a in, a, in an operational role um, and, and, and at the lowest lowest uh, peg in the organisation. But through that, um, was very very fortunate to have um, worked with some amazing people that supported me in um, moving through a number of positions. And ultimately, um, I was lucky enough to effectively be the chief operating officer for um, a relatively big stock broking company here in Australia. Very. Um, what we what we realised um, probably in sort of the mid nineties was that technology would play a pretty significant role um, in how financial services would play out mm. um, in Australia, um, and in particular, we also recognised that individuals, you know, needed access to, you know, financial advice um, or needed access to financial solutions or products or services. So I was actually um, part of a, a, a. There was there was a, there was there was myself and another 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 partner um, when we were at HSBC. We actually set up uh, an online stockbroking business um, in the late nineties um, called HSBC uh, Direct, right. um, which was. Now, if I did that today, I'd I'd be a, a, a tech founder and <laughs> um, very much probably retired. But yeah. but 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 back then, that was just part of the course of what we did for for, for our work. But. Wow. So I was really lucky to, to, to very early on experience, you know, setting up a, an, an online stockbroking business. But but what I realised, and and it was a multilingual business. It was in English, Cantonese, and Mandarin. But what I realised really quickly, um, and I by, by listening to calls because we had both internet and uh, call centre, I realised very quickly that individuals needed help, and, and that the power of getting that help and advice and guidance and education. Um, was quite important. Um, I, I went. I spent a fair bit of time then with HSBC in Europe, um, and and but then I came back and um, worked worked with a number of other organisations. But what I realised um, after um, the GFC was that the power um, of financial advice 
um, was was really important, and that individuals um, needed financial advice, they needed help. Um, and it was only when I was actually uh, having a conversation with my father, uh, and my father had um, had uh, lymphoma, um, and one of the things I do now um, is I'm actually on the board of Lymphoma Australia, yeah. so it's it's a way of giving back. He, look, he passed away, but but I had a number of conversations with my father um, talking about well, what was the legacy that he was leaving, and that then sort of got me thinking. I knew, I, I knew that financial advice. Um, improved well-being. I knew that if people got access to it, it had a profound impact on their lives. So that sort of really started my passion. Probably, you know, it, it, it been accelerated my passion. Sorry, um, for the last ten years, where I have this very strong belief that we know the what what the financial planning industry does changes lives mm. on on so many different fronts. Um, what we know from people's own lives is that. It's not linear. They go through ups and downs, changes. No, I've gone through that. We've all gone through that. So having um, access to um, somebody there to provide support and advice um, on that journey and ultimately lead to a better life is um, is absolutely worth fighting for. So that's um, that's why I'm so passionate about the space that we're in. Awesome. Um, one of the things uh, that we've spoken about is uh, the idea of retirement changing potentially the the concept of it at least um from this you know get as much money as possible and then do as little as possible kind of this this great australian dream of pay your house off get a million bucks in the super and then kind of not really like maybe buy a caravan sell it six months later and not really do a lot that that's that's a pretty you might might take one big sojourn around the world but typically you know fast forward 20 years into retirement you've got these people that are are sort of turning around going you know what i probably could have done more with my life in the last 20 years it's a it it, it, and one of the one of the very interesting views that you've got because of the global nature of your uh, work experience is we were talking about japan Mm. and how in japan uh they have a it's a different view mm. of retirement to Australia. Um, and it is an interesting concept and it, it's something that I'm really looking forward to in terms of connecting advisors all over the world together on Ensemble. To me, that is, that's a huge sort of goal for this company. And one of the reasons is, is, is we can start to export or import, depending on the view that you're coming from, but to see what other countries are doing what their culture and does the financial planning strategies work in these different places around the world and uh and we were speaking about japan and if if you could maybe um if you can just maybe describe it again and yeah i I think this might be one of the benefits of ensemble is to is to get these kind of things out there Sounds great. So first, maybe what I'll do is I'll talk a little bit about uh, Japan, but then I'll also talk a little bit about the the Craig Keery view of retirement yes. and uh, and just some of the trends and debate that that I've seen going on. And look, we we were we were really fortunate to to live in Tokyo. My wife and I, um, and and my daughter for some period of time as well, uh, live in Tokyo for for a number of years. And uh, one of the things that we really observed there was 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 a couple of things. First of all. That, that typically people worked beyond their normal retirement age that they have that we have here in Australia um, and and they found purpose in life it was almost full employment where you had at the even at the local supermarket you had a whole lot of people that typically that you would think um, would be retired but were there um, doing a range of different jobs range of different um, functions and they were really happy they were really happy. And then I, I got really interested in talking to um, a number of people that I worked with and um, this concept of even in financial services where somebody would retire as the CEO but would come back as like uh, like a, a chairman or a chair and they would literally come into the office um, every day 
and they they would there be there to to mentor and support the the the, the younger staff, and then provide really good you know high level uh, impact. Um, across the the industry that they were in, that's quite a common um, part of um, Japanese culture, and I think you know there's this concept of um, ikagi, I K A G I, and this concept where you know people just continue to work, but work in a um, it's all about their well being and the, it's about finding purpose mm. um, in life, and it was really fascinating, and and this so therefore we sort of think about. You know, retirement at say sixty-five. It's driven by a mathematical formula: how much money you need, how long you're going to live for, and what are you going to do with that. I think the I think that's a nothing wrong. That's that's a valid that's a valid um, valid methodology, and it's actually a valid valid approach because it allows um, individuals to save um, towards a particular goal. But what I think where I think this is going to go um, globally is I think. Retirement will get reframed. A, there's a couple of big factors here. One, we're all living longer. Yeah. Um, number two um, is that what we do know um, from a range of mental health, you know, if I look at mental health as really an important factor, people need purpose um, in life and they need something to do. So, therefore, I think this has got a little th- – therefore, we go on that basis, let's look at what um, an individual's goals are going to be. What's going to make them happy? And, and there's a number of different, through my research in, around wellbeing and financial planning, there's a number of different models that you can use regarding that. But but unpacking what's going to make Clayton happy, mm-hmm. what's going to make Craig happy, mm. what's going to make Craig and his wife happy. Yes. And actually that I think gives us the ability to reframe retirement. And that retirement may be a blend of work and and uh and sort of social activities, um, it could just be you know work in a different context. I think this 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 concept of one size fits all, I think is um, I don't think is going to be the way of the future. And I think given what I observed there in Japan, it was just a uh, as I said, people were working longer, they they live longer, um, they're healthy, um, they've got um, and and. They were typically um, had purpose in life. Yes, and I do think um, one of the great things about what we're doing um, in Ensemble is we allow advisors um, to have that conversation in our community and platform. And I really think it's going to be absolutely awesome to have a global conversation mm. around retirement. Yes, because I think there's going to be lots of learnings globally, um, and uh, understanding different cultures and beliefs will. Lead to well, what is your best retirement? Yeah, long winded, long winded response, but no. uh, I, I think it's um, I, you know, I just look at look at people that I talk to, and you know, I'm I'm, I'm in, in my network of friends, they're not rushing to rushing to get the caravan and retire. They're looking at how they have a couple of different trains on the tracks yes. um, that provides a bit of balance, and I think that's going to be the way of the future. Yes, I I actually. Being a financial planner, um, including my my tax accounting career, I, I did about a decade of professional services, sitting in front of people talking about their money. Right? Um, it was it was jolting. Two thing, two two major things that impacted my life from from being a financial planner. One was the the idea of retirement. I I saw these. Men and women, typically there was men um, who were still working later in life um, and those men uh, coming into my office, you know, us working on the pre-retirement, transition to retirement, you know, and and we would still focus on what may, you know, we we, we were aiming for, you know, the the terminology we used at at, at my, uh, my company was ideal lifestyle. Um, so what 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 their ideal lifestyle was in, into retirement, and yet as the years went went on, I saw these they they literally shrank. These men uh, got smaller in front of me over the course of many years, and, and maybe it would be six months or a year between between meetings, and it was a little bit shocking because they'd been this sort of you know bit, bit you know these 
these uh, they had ambition and it, 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 it was and then all of a sudden it became oh you know really relaxed and that really impacted me it mm. it I saw it happen time and time again and it dawned on me I said to myself I never want to retire now whether I end up living that in reality or not but I know for a fact that uh, I want to work as as long as I humanly can and the other the other big impact that it had on me was children. I actually didn't want to have children. Um, but as part of good financial planning, when you're meeting someone, you ask about their family situation and, and undoubtedly the, the conversation always goes to children. And I would see a response in people's eyes when they said that they didn't have children. Now, I, you would never ask, especially at that early stage, whether it was a purposeful decision or, or they just simply couldn't. But I, I just the the their responses to me actually changed my mind as to having children. I, I remember going home to my girlfriend at the time, who then fiance wife now mother of my children. I remember coming back from work one time and I said, "I think we're going to want children when we're older." And she looks at me, she goes, "Wait a second, <laughs> we've been together for a handful of years with, with the premise that we weren't going to have children. Like this is a pretty big change." And uh, and. And um, yeah, needless to say, we ended up uh, agreeing on that, and 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 the and the, re- the rest, as they say, is history. At two a.m. this morning, um, but the the children thing and the retirement thing were both two impacts that it had on me uh, as as an individual. And um, uh, so the reason why I really enjoy financial planning as well is I think it's such a brilliant career that m- and more people need to learn about it. Um, so, and, and, and you're aware of this, um, as a part of Ensemble, as us, you know, doing the raising, expanding around the world, I actually want to operate as an attraction mechanism into the industry. Um, there will be different sort of levels of membership at that stage, you know, um, especially if someone's, you know, want, you know, if they're an aspiring financial planner, for example, mm. they probably shouldn't have access to everything, right? Like there, there, there needs to be some protection mechanisms in place. Um, so I don't know the exact feature set that will allow this to occur off the top of my head. I'm sure we'll figure it out when we get there. But I, I met this financial planner uh, recently that had come in from management consulting. And this this former management consultant left uni, became a management consultant, was in there for two years. And as I'm sure everyone's aware, but if not, I'll, I'll explain it uh, to the listeners out there. Basically, let's say 100 people, 100 graduates get a job in management consulting. The next year, there's 50. The year after, is 25, then 12. And then as you go on, realistically, the, the, the greatest compliment you can have as a, uh, as, as a management consultant is I lasted a decade. Um, it's so it's a, this, this, this younger guy, he'd lasted like three or four years. So, so he, he'd, he'd sort of you know, earn his stripes. And typically what, what guys like that do is go into – what they call industry, so they'll take a, a, a maybe a, a middle management position, uh, you know, and then and then work their way up. He turned that down to become a financial planner, and he so he turned down uh, like a two hundred k salary at about twenty five for a sixty five k salary to become an associate advisor, and because I said to him, "How do we get more of you?" and he said, "You won't because." Of this, what well, that story I just explained back, and I thought, right, in that case, why did you end up coming? And 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 he said, well, I learned about financial planning because I actually as a part of a, a job that we were doing in management consulting land, and I fell in love with it, and I actually realized I really wanted to be a financial planner. And I I looked at this sort of you know highly capable uh, mid twenties guy, and I and I thought. We need to get you before you decide you're going to be a, a management consultant. You should be leaving uni and getting your sixty-five thousand dollars career straight out of uni, so that you're not competing with a two hundred thousand dollars middle management at Telstra, right? So, so what ideas do you have? What kind of views? And 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 if you've never really thought about it, it's totally fine. But it attracting younger people into the industry your son for example right so what could have we done to attract your son i think that's probably a great question um well if i think about uh if if i think about the if i think about the industry and i'll I'll come back to my son uh in a second but if i think about the 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 industry what we do know is that financial planners 
have a huge impact on people's lives. Um, we know that um, when they can um, work with their, their clients um, through a number of different life events, um, they become lifelong relationships um, and they literally um, improve the well-being of, the, of, of, of their clients. And in some cases, you know, with a whole range of other uh, things around sort of well-being, I, I would actually say, uh, you know, their interventions can, can lead to major, major shifts in an individual's mental health as well because they're not worried about their financials. Yeah. Um, so that's it's a pretty purposeful you know, if you put that up there as a profession, that's that's a pretty purposeful um, job. To Absolutely, do, job to do. What can we do to attract more people? I think tell more people about it, mm. and we're doing that today. Mm. Um, there's some other companies out there that um, that, that that are attracting graduates, and, yes. and they're doing a good job with with, with that. Striver, as well. Striver's one. Shout out, Ali. Um, but we as an industry need to tell more stories. We need to tell more life stories. We need to showcase the great work that people do. If I look at the, it always, you know, when I sort of say young people, it makes me feel old. But but, it, <laughs> but, but if, I, if I think about young, if I think about the, the, the generation that we're seeing go, going through university, to, university today, what's important to them? Social purpose. Yeah. Responsibility. Yeah. Um, having an impact on lives. Yeah. That's what financial planning does. Absolutely. So, what do we got to do? We got to tell more people about it. Mm. I do then think we have to develop a really good um, framework within the industry, which allows experienced financial planners uh, to coach and mentor younger financial planners. Yeah. We need to create a platform for interactions um, with people across the community, and Ensemble does that. The other thing that I think we do need to do is that people go into other industries because they see them as global industries. Yes. Um, you know, if I look at, you know, my children, they've gone into the jobs that they that they want to do because they, they yes, they see it as an Australian r r um, organisations, but they actually see the ability to, to travel. And I think that's, you know, I've worked overseas and that's something that, you know, I think this, this generation wants to do. That's a good point. But- Therefore, we need to also create um, a community of financial planners globally yes. that allows people to have portability, yes. allows people to experience different cultures um, and all of that. So I think how do we attract more people in the industry and how do we make it really exciting for young people? I think Ensemble's got a pretty big role to play in the great work that it does in uh, in enabling that. Yeah. Yeah, that's a I, – I think you've just nailed that. Um, in terms of, if I think back to when I was at uni, you would you would look at these, you know, maybe maybe the the reputations aren't as glowing as they once were. These mm. big four, mm. um, but certainly moving the, the portability, the idea that I could take this job, I could get this graduate position, and two years later I could be working in London. Mm. That was that was a that was a huge sort of driving factor. Um, in the end, I actually uh, ended up going into financial planning um, through accounting, actually. So, I started in accounting and then um, I was working in an office with a couple of financial planners and I went, wait a second, as an accountant, I'm looking in the review mirror that's 12 months old, but as a financial planner, I'm looking at the at, at the front window for 40 years and I, yes. and I, and I was like, oh, the, the impact that I can have is so much so much larger. So, I, so I moved from, from accounting to financial planning, but- the, the idea of portability, which which also goes to qualifications like the CFP. It does. Right? So, that CFP really is, I mean, there's over 200,000 now. Um, there's 30,000 CFPs in Japan. There's 33,000 in China. Correct. There's 100,000 or something in America. It's quite large. And and in Australia, we've only got about 5,000, which, which, is, which is pretty crazy considering. Um, and that's just- of the latest um, uh, documents that we were reading the other day. The CFP, though, is the best thing that we have in terms of, hey, I've got my CFP. I can I can go work in the States. Correct. It becomes an anchor. The CFP yeah. becomes the, the anchor qualification. And, um, you know, we, we live in a global glo – well, we are in a global environment, but what, we, we live in a, in, in a world where people – 
where we've got lots of cross cultures, we've got lots of different beliefs, um, we've got um, people that uh, are global citizens. Um, and therefore, if you're thinking about, well, what's the successful financial planner of the future going to be? Um, it's going to have to be a financial planner that understands different cultures, understands different beliefs, because mm. what we were just talking about retirement as an example. And I think that is going to really mean that um, creates a great opportunity, a great opportunity for for planners to work in different countries, and but but go and do do a couple of years in a country, but and potentially come back to Australia or come back to their home country, mm. and be far more qualified to help the people in their home country as well. So I think I, I think we're going to see a lot more of it. Like China was fascinating. We were we were t- chatting about this earlier on in the week. China is now the um, second biggest um, CFP uh, community Crazy. in the world. Yeah, you've got the US and China. Um, and if you just look at what is happening in China, the growth of um, the, the, the the population that is is got access to wealth and and needs advice around that. Yes, it, it's a trend that will continue. Yes. Um, if you just look at the problems that need to be solved globally. Aging population. We're all living. Uh, sorry, aging population. Um, we're 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 very much um, living longer. We've all got different. We've got more money. So there's 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 there's, yeah. there's there's more money flowing around the system. That just creates a greater need, and it's a global need. Yeah, absolutely. It, um, one of the things that Paul Barrett, uh, the CEO at um, AZNGA, says, and and I love it. Uh, he says we're on the cusp of an of a multi-decade boom in financial planning. Hundred percent, and um, that that kind of sentence really does sh- sends shivers down my spine. In the sense that I couldn't agree more. Everything you've just said um, alludes to the fact that we have a lot ahead of us, and I think financial planning has traditionally been quite a cottage industry. It's a, it's, it's a bunch it of does. small. Businesses. I mean, you've all you've you've had your AMPs and your your IWFs and your, um, but realistically, it, it. But we're starting to see the beginnings of these mega, mega like AZ. You know, w- w- winding up almost a hundred of, of Australia's largest practices. Actually, to be fair, David Haynes. If I go back, he did. He, I think, he was the first. The Shadforth, that yes. that exit, that was a that was a big deal, but that was a little while ago now. So, uh, you're seeing the sophistication across companies like Invest Blue, for example, has existed for quite a while. And um, and I saw their head of um, culture present in Cebu a week or so ago, and she was saying that their goal is to now impact forty thousand people's lives. Yep. And I, I quite liked her uh, reasoning. She says, and where do we get the number 40,000? She said, well, originally it was 4,000 and we hit it, so we made it 10 times bigger. <laughs> it, but, but it's they, worth, worth fighting for. Absolutely. Absolutely. But the, the, the move away from cottage industry and into sophisticated business models it is really making this industry look far more attractive to outside money, for example. Yep. You've just got, uh, it was in the, in the AFR. Uh, recently, with TA um, getting closer to to purchasing into the Australian environment, we, you know they they own a couple of uh, uh, companies already, but specifically into financial advice. And yeah, I'm I'm looking I'm looking across what what on where Ensemble is placed, and I'm saying I, I don't think this is just a great place to be right now. Uh, look, it's a, look, uh, I agree with Paul Barrett's comments. It, it, we are on. If you if you just look at the basics trends, mm-hmm. um, more and more people need advice now than ever. Yes, we've got a a growing need. Um, we 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 people are open to to, to 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 engaging with that advice. We've got it's complex. It, it work trying to work out what to do with um, with your life assets and and your financial life assets is complicated. How much do you keep? How, what, what what do you pass on? What do you? How do you utilize that? How do you invest that? Um, how do you make sure that you protect that? Th- these are all big problems to solve, and it's not. It, it requires um, 
it requires a professional. Yeah. Um, technology absolutely has a role to play in yeah. in, in accelerating um, how that professional can interact with people. But we are on the cusp, I think, of of a of a global global boom. Yeah, a global boom, um, because the need is not going away. Yeah, and I think the other thing that's really exciting is we're a global. We, we are a global. We, we have a global culture. There, there's 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 more and more people um, that live and work overseas from from all different countries. Um, now the borders are open, we're seeing that um, here in Australia as well again, which is great. Yes. So therefore, having um, financial advisors that um, are experienced in global mobility, are, but but also are experienced in cult- different cultures and understanding different cultures, is is going to be the is is also going to be truly necessary. And I think it's really exciting. It's look, it's worth. From my perspective, it is worth fighting for. We know um, what we do um, in this industry is high impact, and uh, we've got the ability to create a wonderful, wonderful uh, legacy um, for the industry, and it's certainly worth fighting for. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. Um, one of the things that when, when I talk about an alignment of values, culture was right at the top, right? Um, you know, there's there's many sort of cliches that get thrown around. You know, culture eats strategy for breakfast, and yada yada yada. Um, and yet, at the same time, culture, uh, a good culture, amplifies the rest of the company, right? In terms of execution, in terms of uh, you know, in terms of just people wanting to turn up to work, it has such profound impacts. Culture truly is, I think, sort of a, a leverage point that. But the team here at Ensemble, we've really fostered over like nine years in total, but realistically, the last four years of, as we've been sort of operating um, as we are today. One of the things that I did when, when, we, when we met was, you know, I spoke to Roxy, I spoke to a couple of people, and it was strange in the sense that everyone was so positively supportive of you. I was like, that's it. I've got to, I've got to go speak to a competitor, mate. <laughs> <laughs> I've got to find someone, and even even the people that that um, you would have gone up against in terms of uh, strategic sort of you know deals mm. in the past, they were even those, even they were very supportive of you. And I thought, okay, that, that to me that's that's such a clear indicator, right? Now, in terms of the culture here at Ensemble, I have no doubt that you would have done your own due diligence on, on us and I'm super keen to ask, you know, what what was the, sort of the prevailing thoughts out there? Look, it's a, it's a great question and uh, and and this was a me, me taking on this role. Um, I wanted to make sure that I could um, – there was a couple of key things. One, I needed to work for a company w- which had an alignment of values. Um, but number two, I wanted to work for a company that um, was ambitious and, and, and absolutely – um, wanted to to grow, and then thirdly, I wanted to work for a company that was well respected by the the community um, that it serves. Um, I did a uh, did did a range of things as as part of my own due diligence, for what of a better <laughs> word. Um, first of all, we had a lot of conversations, and I was walking out of those conversations going, "There's there's there's, there's the, the the relationship between a chair and a CEO is a really important relationship. Yeah. It requires." High trust, high alignment, um, and I was walking out of those and was really pleased um, that we were absolutely <laughs> on the same page. And I was trying to. I asked you. Uh, I asked you different questions, different. Wa- so I've, I asked you the same question different ways and got the same answer. So that, that was all good. But then, secondly, you know, it was really important that I spent time with the um, the current board and and what was. Um, um, fascinating um, in that conversation was the board had all recognized that um, A, the great work that they had done, but B, um, that to take the business to the next level, it required a a slightly different skill set and a a complementary skill set. And they were really open to that. Now, um, in an industry where sometimes we see ego come into play, that was just a, a, a massive positive flag for me that you, you had a group of directors that were that were really open to thinking about in the interests of this company, yes, and and not just their own interests, yeah. as to how they could grow the business and what what the complementary skill set 
um, that, that was required. And then I, I, I met the team. And, and uh, look, look, that was, um, that was the thing that nailed it for me. Um, clearly, <laughs> you know, you were a positive influence on that, Clayton. <laughs> but um, what, what I, you know, and I asked, I went through a series of meetings with, 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 with your team and the alignment of values, the passion, the commitment, and everybody was um, – they're all very, very different, but yes. they've actually come together yes. um, on, 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 and got skill sets that when they bring together um, are incredibly powerful. And yeah. that, to me, was a, was a massive um, positive flag. But then when you um, – I think there was one thing when you told me that you had – at your last licensee um, – all, all, sorry, all licensee PD day – I think there was 1,850 or... Well, well, there was over 2,000 registrations. Over 2,000 registrations. And I I, sh- I, I remember going, shit, that, that's like, really? Like that, uh, and, I, <laughs> and I kept on, you know, and I was then going through and looking on LinkedIn and I could see all the, the people in the room as well. And yeah, yeah. The boom and... Yeah. Um, and then the positive influence. And uh, I then sort of spoke to different planners that were using the solution and, and no- nobody actually had a... Uh, a, a, a bad word to say about the business, and actually saw it as as a really good way to foster a positive culture across the industry. So, culture culture is a is an important part of a um, business, and mm-hmm. I've seen businesses succeed with a positive culture um, and and smash the lights out, and I've seen businesses go the other way around, all driven um, by, by by culture. And I think um, one of the things that I think Ensemble. Um, has got with its stakeholders, its board, its shareholders, and its staff is an alignment around that purpose and vision. Yes. And um, that's pretty unique. Mm. And that, I think, is what is going to drive the the next phase of uh, the awesomeness mm. of what Ensemble is going to be. Yeah. It's, it's um, what it, it originally started out as a methodology to 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 get as much done in as short a time as possible so before we before i knew anything about the impact of culture on a company we always had such grand ambitions and grand plans and 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 desire to execute that the culture ended up being built as a natural result of not having the time to do anything political. The, 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 there was no time for anyone to sit down and figure out what the best thing is for me as an individual because we were all so busy uh, trying to get as much work done as possible. And then this just continued to happen to, a, to I think, maybe two years ago, something like that, um, when we started growing the company in terms of headcount. Now we're at about 15 or so. But th- I think this was still when we we're about, you know, less, certainly less than a handful. And I realized, uh, I was speaking to, to Emily. Uh, Emily is, is the personification of the culture of this company. And, and in a lot of ways, the, our, our, our anti-employee handbook, employee handbook, um, it is, is a result of her and, 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 and the original founders sort of just attempting to get as much done as quickly as possible. And what I realized was when I sort of sat down and started to codify it, it, it ended up being a, a document which set a pretty clear agenda for what it's like to work in Ensemble. And, and you know, if, if I just sort of pick a couple of things off the top of my head, uh, you know, we're not into pinching um, uh, days off to go to like a friend's wedding, for example, uh, in terms of your annual leave because, well, more than likely you're killing it at work and so as a reward you know like sure oh you need to take two days off for for uh for a friend's wedding let's call it one i'll split it with you right now it also goes on to say that if this needs to be explained to you you're probably not a good fit for this company because there's obviously there are people that will look at that and go oh great i can just you know do this that and the other right but very quickly because of the amount of work that we get done there's nowhere to hide in this company, and so and so the the idea that it, a generosity it's 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 reciprocated. Now, how that works as we expand further, 
I don't know. I and and I've never I've never grown a large business before. But it's fine to say we don't know. Yeah, that's exactly right. Mm. And and um, these days, uh, you know, and, and and this is something that Emily s- said to me. She said, "Well, now that we have let's let's call it now that we have a professional a chair." Shout out to Chairman Mao, Roxy. Now that we have a professional chair, are we? Uh, do we need to change the culture? And I said, you know what? The great thing is, is as Craig said, one of the things he loves about this company is the culture, and he he wouldn't want it to change. No, I think. Look, if I just talk a little bit about South Africa, and I think the execution of going live in South Africa to some extent is a great case study for the culture of this business. Um, you know, you you went live last week. Mm. Um, it was a an amazing success. Yeah, I asked one question uh, 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 as part of that process, and 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 was very quickly realised that it was on track. And I think you, you you what 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 you saw from that was a high trust environment. You yes. had, you know, we, we you spoke about Emily. Um, you spoke about M. Uh, you know, an individual that that. That sort of is the that typifies what this business is all about. Um, was able to um, execute, uh, um, go live, um, and um, really to be to be direct, set the business up well yeah. and for, for for global success. Yeah, um, and all of that was done um, because of trust um, and capability. And I think that um, sort of really does uh, typify the culture uh, at Ensemble. And which is why the business is going to continue to be um, successful. I just take your point on the uh, on the annual leave and days off. Look, I'm I'm going off on three weeks leave, so uh, you know I could uh, I could really uh, testify to that fact uh, that uh, I think it might actually be three and a half. So uh, yes. uh, which uh, which uh, sort of exa- goes to that uh, goes to that very point. Absolutely, I'll make sure I do take some phone calls now and again as well. Thanks, mate. That's hilarious. Um, yeah, the the thing, I mean, and just even diving into South Africa a little bit, Emily, the, the, and this is the nature of the beast of this company, right? We've got we've got half the team here in Australia, half the team are in the Philippines, right? Mm. And I think as the company expands from here, actually, we're going to grow more of the team in the Philippines. So we'll probably end up being um, outweighed by by our our headcount in the Philippines moving forward from series a onwards um but the 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 australians that we have in this company the let's call it just the heads of mm-hmm. right are 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 so focused on executing within their channel that emily for example basically came up with the whole strategy execution at, by herself so like what a what a wild company to be a part of where I'm working with you on a couple of uh, global initiatives. That's where my focus is. But Emily's handling an entire international launch by herself. It, it, I mean, it's so rare to, to have a, a, a team that can just pick that up. And, but, but she has done that, right? She start, she's employee number one. She w- was employed by this company even before I was. And when she first started, she was given, or I gave her three small paragraphs in a Word document that said, oh, we've got a Facebook group, we hold an occasional event, and we do podcasts. If you can make these three things better, you've got a job. And so, from her very earliest days in this company, she's been able to take a very small amount of uh, detail and 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 expand it into what we see today. Like it, it's 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 crazy. And and as we've spoken about um, with Emily before as well, she represents the financial planner. She her what she wants in this company literally is word for word what the financial planners want. And to have that permanent advocate in this company operationally. And then obviously we've got Ben Nash, who's on the board. So at a board level, at operationally, I used to be a financial planner, but but you know these days I'm stuck in like legal documents at accounting, right? So it, which is the fate of it of any CEO. But oper- yeah, one of the the clearest things is our dedication to to financial planning. Oh look look look, you see that um, 
every day, every hour, every minute in this business. We know that those companies or organizations which have a connection to the customer or to a connection to the people that they're serving are far more successful than those that aren't. Yeah. What we know with Ensemble is that connection to the financial planners and that unwavering commitment um, and as a result of that unwavering commitment, two-way trust, that is what actually um, is creates the foundations for the business. And yes. what I would say is you've got um, a number of people um, with them being employee number one that typify that culture and that culture oozes through yeah. um, the business. Yeah, I, I was speaking to um, – I actually won't mention their name, but a substantial individual in the in the industry. And this person gives me a call, um, and we'd spoken maybe once in the past. Goodness, I wouldn't have been surprised if they didn't remember who I was, right? Um, and this individual says, gives me a call and says, you know, I'm very familiar with Ensemble. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he says, I'm on it every single day. Mm. I am one of your super users but you'll never see me ever uh, uh, posting anything. He said, because I actually receive so much value from belonging to it, but 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 I I never partake in it. He said, but I'm very familiar with all of the with all of the people that are that are on there. And uh, the amount of times that I've heard that sentence, because we we see the numbers, right? Like the people who log in far outweigh the people who are who are who are commenting and posting, but by the way, there's still thousands and thousands of conversations going on. So sometimes I do because I'm because my head's in the in in the books, so to speak. You know, but so you know, even last night I was at an industry event, and uh, I don't think I met someone who didn't know who we were, and these are people I'd never met before. In fact. From 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 the senior person who presented on stage, to I met a brand new financial planner who who's about who's about my age, about forty years old, just joined the industry. Through the whole gambit, everyone was like, "Oh, ensemble, you're ensemble," and and, and um, it does take me. It, it does actually. I forget that. It, you know, I'll, I'll look at a number. So, for example, this podcast gets downloaded over twenty thousand times a month. It's for financial planners. That's that's more downloads per month than there are financial planners, right? That's how that's how crazy that is, and and yet I look at I look at the stats and go, oh yeah, twenty thousand. That's a lot. But then when someone says, oh, I was listening to the podcast, blah blah blah, blah and I go, I, it, it's when when it when I when I talk to people, the impact is from them is so much more scalable than than I kind of remember often. Well, I think what what not I think I what my my hypothesis is that I think Ensemble um, has created an environment which, as I said, is high trust. And as a result of that being high trust, financial planners and members of the of the community are really um, don't feel vulnerable in asking questions or asking for help or seeking advice yeah. themselves. That's a pretty pretty unique position to be in and you only get to be in that position because of the trust yeah and as as a result of that because people uh, we know that the people that go into our community get you know planners get help to help them deliver things to their clients that's why they're remembering ensemble it's because yeah. of those moments of um moments of truth that they've had with their clients yeah and we play a part uh in that yeah well i mean and as a perfect example of uh, you know one of the people was saying that uh that 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 the um it was something very simple like the agenda that they send their clients for ongoing annual mm. catch ups they downloaded from Ensemble because someone had uploaded this document that says hey Fantastic. this is the end this is the agenda that yep. I send and this person was like oh I love that right and so if we really go back to to why Ensemble started. It was a bunch of practice principles. We were late twenties, early thirties, and we just wanted to accelerate that journey to mastery. Mm. But I tell you what's super interesting is that never that never stops. What like mastery isn't 
a destination. Mastery is it is is the journey itself. Spot on. And so, no matter how how advanced someone becomes, I mean, at Federer still has a a tennis coach, right? Like, no matter how good you are, you constantly want to get better. And all we tried to do nine years ago was accelerate that. And what it's to, what 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 it looks like now, never would have guessed, but it has been the you know our, our sole purpose is to drive the positive revolution of financial advice, and and it's awesome that all of these years later that that sentence it still rings true. Look, it's it's great, and look, high performance is all. If you look at the people that strive for high performance, it's recognizing that the journey never stops. Uh, number one, number two, it's having a high trust relationship with with somebody or a or a service or a solution where they can get input on how they're tracking and ask for help and not feel vulnerable in asking for help. Yeah, that's really what Ensemble does. Yeah. Um. So no different to uh, coaching a uh, a tennis player, coaching an athlete. Uh, just coaching somebody that's looking to improve their academic performance, no different mm-hmm. whatsoever. Yes. Well, mate, I just wanted to thank you for coming on um, because you know you, you're you're now a significant uh, part of this company and this company's future. And yeah, just wanted to really thank you for for joining our board as chair. Uh, it's been a pleasure to have you, mate. And uh, thanks for joining us today. Well, th- look, thanks for having me. And as as I said, uh, what you've achieved, uh, the board has achieved, um, but your team has achieved. Is, is is remarkable and uh, I'm sure in the next 10 years when somebody's listening to this podcast uh, they will uh, the business will be even bigger than what it is today amen to that cheers mate excellent <laughs>